So welcome, my name is Luis. I'm also one of the organizers for this meeting. And it's my pleasure now, my pleasure now to invite Rodrigo Medellin, who's gonna give the first talk for this symposium that is called Research in the Global South and the Need for Intercontinental Collaboration. Uh, thank you all for being here and let's listen a little bit more about Global South. Thank you. Thank you, Luis. Thank you, Vikes. Thank you, Senor Rector. Thank you very much for that moving uh, words. I am going to just try to summarize very, very briefly the very important message that uh, President of the University, Gustavo Gutierrez Espeleta, uh, a colleague and friend for many years, uh, we teach a conservation biology course here from the University of Costa Rica and the University of Mexico every other year, and she's always there, and she's always delivering these talks. He, he welcomed us, and he highlighted the importance of the work that we all do in terms of conservation, in terms of our, our commitment to making the world a more sustainable place for everyone, thinking of our home, of, of the planet as our home, which is our home that we share with many other species around the world. Um, he, he, is, uh, he is a molecular geneticist. His work was on the big sheep. Uh, that's when we started crossing paths, and then he came back to, to Costa Rica, and we just kept expanding and expanding and expanding the collaboration. He now... <laughs> leads the most amazing university. Um, he He's opening the doors of Costa Rica to every one of us here. And um, his main message here then is to thank us all for the work that we've been doing and to make us aware of the fact that it doesn't matter if we publish a hundred papers. If those 100 papers do not become policy, it's as if they did not exist. We have to make our research relevant to policy. This is a key message from Dr. Gustavo Gutierrez Espeleta. Thank you, Gustavo. Um, okay, I'm going to start uh, my talk. It's really a, a dream to see you all here, let me tell you. I want to um, have this very brief moment to thank a few people that have been absolutely crucial to have us here. Of course, Gustavo Gutierrez Espeleta, Bernal Rodriguez, who has been amazing in instrumenting all of these things. You, 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 you don't see many of the myriad details that he has taken care of. And of course, you all know that without one individual here, Bragde Sanchez Talavera, we would not be here. Simply, we would not be here. She has fixed so many issues in so many dimensions that like they, I want to thank you very much for that. <laughs> the rest of the team in Global South Pass has been absolutely instrumental. They, they've been engaged, they've been working constantly to make sure that the network continues to expand, continues to, to work, continue to engage more and more people. And I want to thank them all. But I also want to ask you to please come and, and meet them and talk to them and ask them how did they possibly were able to do something like that, keeping the network alive when they're all having from, from uh, full-time jobs to being a graduate student, to being an undergraduate student, to being a biologist in the field and in the process running this net. It's, it is really amazing. And I thank you all for, for all of your efforts there. Okay, so I'm gonna start by telling you a little bit about how we began developing all of these networks. Uh, we have to start by, by, no, this is not my, my remote is not working. Um, so, the issue that we have been facing for many, many years is that usually the international collaboration is with or maintained by people from the global north. We never, in the global south, we never have any contact with people from other global south countries, except if they are direct neighbors. But someone from Asia has never joined forces with someone from Latin America. 
Someone from Africa has never joined forces with someone from Asia. This is exactly what we're here for. We are here to facilitate and promote and encourage and empower and connect everyone in the global south. This is the main, the main point. Um, we have all received visitors from the global north, but rarely from the global south. And usually the collaborations are very, very imbalanced. So besides the fact that we in the, in the global south share the same opportunities and the same challenges from being biodiversity hotspots to having high deforestation and extinction rates, to scarce resources to do research or conservation and limited collaboration with other global south uh, people, we face a very similar reality, every one of us. So it's time to really join forces. The beginnings was in 1994 when I started my first network, the Program for Conservation of Mexican Bats. Um, you can see me there, that's me with glasses and with some hair, yes, some hair. Um, so, so from there, 1994, that we created the first uh, program for conservation of bats in the continent, we started really putting together the strategy to join forces with many other people, many other elements, and begin this incredible collaboration. Everything that we have done all over, over the last 40 years that I've been working in conservation is based on this. I'm allowing recording, right? Alguien me está pidiendo permitir grabación. Voy a decir que sí. Okay. Um, uh, everything that I have done is solidly based in this three-pronged strategy in which conservation actions, research, and environmental education connect with each other in every, every, every direction. Then, in 1997, we started birthing the idea of, of bringing to life other programs for conservation of bats across Latin America, but that did not come to fruition for the next 10 years. Then, in 2007, I got together with a group of people, mostly from the Global South, but also from the Global North, having a view of conservation. How do we in the Global South see conservation in the world? And basically the take home messages in that paper that appeared in science in 2007 is that successful global strategies for biodiversity conservation require increasing reliance on local leadership and major investment in local capacity. And then we look, we examine the, the modus operandi of the big the big NGOs that basically conservation policies are planned, dictated, and often implemented from the global north with little or no local involvement or leadership from the global south. And in, on top of that, there is absolutely no connection. I mean, for example, one of these videos, I'm not going to say which one, but any of them has it, they're going to have a Colombia program. Okay. And they're going to have an Ecuador program. And, and Colombia reports to Washington, D.C. And Ecuador reports to Washington, D.C. But Colombia and Ecuador never talk. Even when they have so much in common, they never talk. And that is a major missed opportunity. So in 2007, we came together as the Latin American Network for Bad Conservation, or RELICON. And at the beginning, it was only seven, uh, uh, sorry, five countries. You can see a big map right here. Uh, I, I look exactly the same, right? Um, uh, in, in, in Mexico. But, but then, when, as, as we started growing today, RELCOM includes 23 countries, some of the countries in Africa, Asia, I'm sorry, in, in Central America, South America, and the Caribbean, and Mexico. We are there. We have one or two uh, members that are still to be to become members of of, uh, of of the network. But we have made an incredible progress. Two years later, we came where else? Costa Rica to put together the strategic planning for REL. And this strategic planning has guided us since 2009 to now. We continue to follow that strategic plan. Um, uh, okay, so then. We, together with other people, got some, some private donor money to go to Africa and not tell them how to do things. We came to tell them what we did in Latin America. And we hung back as resource people and we let the process roll and have the African contingent come up with their own. 
ideas, the wrong priorities, the wrong strategies. And that is exactly what led to what is called now Bank Conservation Africa in 2013. And Paul Wevala is probably going to tell us a bit more about that. Uh, and then, of course, the next step is to, to, to connect the continents. So in 2020, we came together on the coast of Kenya to connect Africa and Latin America in an amazing uh, uh, workshop and bad course in which so many connections started developing. And there's, there started to be collaborations across the Atlantic. This is exactly the feeling, the meaning, the concept, the objective that we want to continue to see. Uh, the group was incredibly productive, incredibly committed. We continue to be working uh, along all of these lines, always with a big and determined support of the National Geographic Society has been behind this idea from its inception. Um, and then, of course, in 2018, we teach a course, uh, a bat biology and conservation course in the Peruvian Amazon. And I'm hearing Farah Carrasco, I'm putting you on the spot. Um, uh, I'm hearing that hopefully next year, or if not the following year, but hopefully next year, we're going to teach it again. But uh, this, this was a dream come true. Having an African professor like Paul Wevala lecture to a Latin American audience had, was something that had never happened before. Never happened before. And you can see the structure shaking already. This is a structure that we need to tear down. We need to connect Africa and Asia and Latin America so that Asians come to Latin America to teach, Africans go to Asia to teach, etc., etc., etc. That is a connection that we need. We get together in, in September of 2022 to, to expand, to propagate the concept of the network and to invite additional people. This is only last year in the Latin American uh, Conservation Network. How am I doing this with time? For the um, and, and okay, so today in the network, we have 320 bad enthusiasts from 40 countries. Right now, right here in this auditorium, we have 15 countries represented. Just, just sit that in. This is historical. What we're doing, what we're all building here is nothing short of story. Uh, it says we have a real and next generation of United Bad Conservationists. I am not the next generation, my friends. The next generations are all of you. And my main and sole point is to empower you. I am going to lead you from behind. I am not going to be here forever. And I know that, and I've been replacing myself for the past 10 years, I've been investing my time in replacing myself everywhere in the world, in every kind of thing that I do, from micron sheep to proper animal, to black bear, to jaguars, to bats, to everything. This is one more step in that process of empowering the next generation of United Bank Conservationists. So what we are doing and what you are about to experience this uh, in this coming week, some of you, but then but but we will have another another opportunity for you. Let me tell you, uh, is is uh, is really amazing, really astounding. The next um, Global South Bats workshop and course is going to be taught. Hopefully, we 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 hope that the house is going to accept. I mean, we already have some talks with her, but she's in the air right now. She's traveling to Costa Rica right now. But it's likely, hopefully, probably, maybe in Malaysia. We may come to Malaysia. It's going to be fantastic, guys. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be very competitive. Oh, we're going to put a lot of hurdles. And you have it. You can do it. All you have to do is to fulfill all the requirements and you will be there. Mark my words. Okay, so uh, we have social media, global self bats, global self bats, global self bats. And please, I want you to invite you, if you're not members of this incredible network, Angelica was describing it like a LinkedIn for, for bad people. I describe it as the Facebook of bad people. However you want to call it, it's an incredible connection in which you can learn and teach and join forces with other people about ideas that you thought were impossible and somebody else may have the answer. 
So just think about that and try to try to join us there. Uh, so that's my that's my talk. I think I want to stop here. Thank you very much for your participation here. Uh, thank you, Rodrigo, for keeping in time. Bye. My congratulations. I always keep in time. No, always. Okay. Uh, I also want to welcome everybody. We have a bunch of people that are joining us through Zoom. Um, welcome. Thank you for spending some time. I know for some of you it's night time. So I hope you have a nice tea or something while you're watching this. And right now we have the next talk that. Uh, it's coming to us from Peru. And we have Farah Carrasco. And let me just, while well, we get this sorted, Sarah, uh, Farah is going to talk to us about studying bats in the Peruvian Amazon, research stories and reflections on the strengths and challenges. And one thing that I want to emphasize is that when we uh, invited the speakers, we asked them to highlight some of the challenges and some of the strengths of doing research in their countries or in their areas. So you're gonna hear some of this and I want people to keep in mind what are the challenges and the strengths that, that everybody's given. So with that all, yeah, we are now ready. Hello everyone, I'm really happy to be here and be able to share with you some of my experiences working doing research in Peru. And I'm also gonna share some challenges that we face when doing uh, research with us in my country. So first of all, just to give you a little bit of... Context. <laughs> yeah. Peru. Peru is in South America. We have its neighbors in Ecuador, Colombia, Brazil, Bolivia, Chile, and also I pointed where in Costa Rica is, so you can have a general idea of the education. We in the school have been taught that Peru has three big regions, the coast, the Andes, and the Llano, simply, as simple as it sounds. But the reality is that we have a really heterogeneous uh, land. We, according to the Ministry of Environment, 36, uh, different ecosystems. And the Amazon forest in the territory of Peru is 60% of the whole territory. And also we, we have the presence of the Andean mountain range that creates this crazy topography in the country, but also it's a challenge for us as researchers because it's very hard to access some of the remote areas. And in addition to the extension of the whole country. This diversity of ecosystems and the presence of this uh, topography also holds a really high diversity of different taxa. And as an example, for the reason we are here, for bats, we have this year a record of 195 species. This website is, maintained, is created, owned, and maintained by, by Paul Velasco, sorry. And it's a great reference for Peruvian researchers and anybody that wants to do research in Peru because we can keep track of how many species we have in the country. So I'm going to share with you three different studies. And in three different locations of the country, all of them in the Amazon. And behind the, these studies are three different motivations or main motivations. I wanted to know how the, what species were located in all of these study areas, but also what are the impacts that uh, the different land use types present in the landscape are having in biodiversity. And I found one mitigation measure that I wanted to know if it was working or not. So I will start by talking about agricultural activities and how those activities impact the bat sandwiches. And this study was uh, undertaken in Madre de Dios. Madre de Dios is called the capital of biodiversity in Peru. Do you know or have you heard about the Manu National Park? It's in, in Madre de Dios. However, as you can see the red color, um, it's facing a really high rate of deforestation. And the reasons behind uh, the, those rates are these some of these drivers, the presence of the interoceanic highway, which goes from Cusco to Brazil, uh, once it was opened and paved, opened the doors for agricultural expansion, 
and also other activities such as illegal gold mining. And I don't know if you had the chance, but if you look gold mining, Madre de Dios, you will see this horrible devastation of biodiversity and forest in, the, in this beautiful region. And it's not the only thing that is happening. Illegal gold mining is also bringing activities as human trafficking, violence, narco traffic, all mixed because of this uh, type of activity that is happening. And this is also a challenge for us as researchers because we need to take into account our safety in the field. These uh, activities limit the expansion or the site that we are visit for doing research. So for this first study, uh, we established 12 different sites along the uh, interoceanic highway. I was avoiding the illegal gold mining area. And uh, six of these sites had the presence of pa uh, papaya plantations and the other six have the presence of cattle ranch. And I want to highlight here something that I consider as a strength in doing research in Peru. All of these areas were located in private land. The owners of these areas uh, re uh, receive us with the, with the open arms, and they were really uh, helpful and willing to give us uh, support in terms of logistics, a place to stay. And this is it's incredible because we were people that they didn't know. And after hearing what were our ideas to work with bats, I was like, Senorita working with bats was really weird, but still they were willing to help us and it was super important. Without their help and permission to access their land, we couldn't do any work in here. So this is a sampling design. We placed three different transects with camera, sorry, with the business in these three different habitats for an interior, for a stage, and agricultural land that could be papaya plantation or cattle pasture. So we placed in business, we were revising them, uh, checking the captures, taking out the uh, bats from the business, and in total we have 3,355 captures along around 10 months of um, work. And thankfully, in Peru we have really good taxonomies, so they were helping me to identify the species we captured. We, uh, we had 54 species in general, but 43 of them were from the Philosophic family. And what we found is that uh, in the landscape that had the presence of papaya plantation, the estimated rich, uh, species richness was higher compared to the landscape that had the cattle pasture. And our capture rate also was higher in the papaya plantation itself compared to the cattle pasture. Additionally, we found that the type of habitat was a factor that was impacting the composition of the species. So you can see that here on the <laughs> on the left, we have all the uh, species composition found in forest interior, different from the edge, different from the agricultural land. And this is a way that I wanted to show, like a puzzle, the presence of a species of different uh, profit yields. And in summary, the papaya plantations was more rich, even in terms of tropic species um, present compared to cattle pasture. So my conclusion was that. Landscape with Cacabaya plantation was more friendly for phylostomid bats. However, we need to take into consideration that these nuts were adjacent to continuous forests that could be uh, serving as a source. This work was possible thanks to different uh, collaborators, and as I mentioned, the support of the landowners that allow us to go into their land, uh, my field assistant, and different NGOs and a company called Zumba helped me um, providing me equipment so that, that I didn't have in Peru. Some funding sources came from my university in, in, in Gainesville, University of Florida, but also from external sources that I had the privilege to know about. And this is not the case for researchers in Peru, especially younger, younger researchers. So funding is very key, and these funding sources are maybe not accessible or even, even visible for, for other researchers that, be, that live, study, and work in Peru. The second study I wanted to share with you is related to the riparian forest strip, and it happened in the San Martin region, that is in the north central part of the country, also a department with really high rate of deforestation. And something that, as part of the context, in Peru we have a strong uh, legislation for hydric resources, and it says that it is mandatory to keep the riparian forest um, on the sites or adjacent to any source of water, let's say lakes, lagoons, rivers, or the streams, they should have these uh, forest strips surrounding them. The question I had behind was if riparian forest strips 
that were kept in modified landscapes aim to maintain the diversity of plants. And for this, uh, I collaborated with a company that was planning to establish a palm plantation, not for the oil, but for selling the heart of the palms. And they uh, bought the land from the community uh, and they cleared the, the forest there, keeping the, the riparian forest streets around the streets. And we weren't sure if these uh, streets were having a conservation value or not. So we established three different uh, treatments one with just continuous forest, another with continuous forest with the presence of the streams, and another one when the company already cleared the forest, but they maintain the riparian forest streets around the streams present. So we did the same. We captured bats with the missionaries. We had in that location 1,261 individuals that belong to a total of 48 species and 43 phylostomic species. So what we found here is the, that in the areas where the forest was taken down, but the forest streets were maintained surrounding the streams, the variation of the capture rate in the edge and the stream in the middle of the forest street was uh, having abundant, very few abundant species, several common um, species, and many rare, as you can see by the tail of the, the curve. So I can say that even though these repairing strips that were 50 meters wide only, could, uh, they can be considered narrow. However, they maintain 80% of the species that were registered in continuous forests and all the trophic yields that were registered in the area. So they show that have an important, uh, an important conservation value, but this study was made only during the first stages of the clearing. It will be great to be able to come back and see what is happening with these forest strips now that the plantation is established and, established and producing the, the product. And last, I wanted to share what we have done, I'm sorry, there is a mistake, uh, together with the Field Museum of Natural History of Chicago, one of the rapid inventories, that in this case was binational between Peru and Colombia. Uh, this was a uh, located, or one of the sites was located in the corner northeast of Peru. And in Colombia, the sites were also present in the uh, Amacayoko National Park. So um, I want to say that this was a rapid inventory that was super expensive. The logistics was crazy. We needed to have helicopters, we needed to have boats, camps prepared before, because it wasn't only me working with bats, but uh, ichthyologists, ornithologists, geologists. So it was expensive, but if I would like to go to the same location, I would be able to do it by myself because of the cost of the logistics. So this is a map of where the location, the points that were sampled were located. And what we did for the battle specifically, we placed quiz nets in the trails and we also used uh, recorders uh, by the trails and also by the streams. This allows us to record 22 species that we captured, 20 of them from the philostomic family. And uh, we are still working on analyzing the data, but we have 27 taxa or sonotype sono species, and we could identify them and to the level of species only in for 17 of them. Uh, so as a summary of the challenges that uh, I have been mentioning and I have been thinking about that I wanted to share with you, we have the difficulty to access remote areas. Huge and expensive logistics to access the remote areas in Peru are needed, huge budgets for that. Um, because it's so hard to get to remote areas, there is, that's why we have concentration of studies in areas that are more accessible. As an example, the work that we did along the Interesanic Highway, I mentioned the funding, external source sources are not visible and not accessible for everyone, especially younger researchers that live, study, and work in Peru. The importance of collaboration, not only inside the country, but outside um, in the country and outside academia. So I mentioned that I collaborated with different um, landowners and also companies, and this was key to allow me to work and do the research of what in this uh, landscape that I was study. Um, and there is another aspect in terms of the lack of expertise or maybe infrastructure 
for preparing biologists in Peru, and this can be um, covered by collaborations with uh, people in other regions, with researchers in other countries and other continents, as Rodri was mentioning. And safety is a really important one. Uh, ideal activities and unsafe conditions, unfortunately, are commonly overlapping the areas where we do bad research and other kinds of research. So that make us think about where we can sample, when we can stay. As bad researchers, we need to work during the night. It's even more uh, complicated. So that's something that we uh, have as a, set, a challenge and we are always have in mind and we need to deal with. So uh, with this, I'm finishing my presentation. I mentioned briefly the results of the study. Do you want to know more? Almost everything is published and you can look for them. And I thank you very much for your attention. So many, many thanks, Mara. Um, we're going to hold questions, but we have two more talks and then we're going to go to a coffee break and you're, uh, please look for the speakers and ask them any question that you have about it. And now we're not in San Juan, we're in San Jose, but we still have somebody from Puerto Rico here with us. So uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Angelo Soto Centeno from Puerto Rico, who's going to talk about uh, deconstructing the extension uh, susceptibility of the insular Caribbean bats. So take us to the Caribbean, Angelo. Uh, buenos días a todos. Uh, gracias, Víquez. Eh, gracias, Rodrigo. Y, y a todo lo que el grupo de Global South Bats. Uh, I'm really excited to show or showcase some of the really amazing work that we do in our lab. This is, how, I want to be honest ahead of the game. This is not only just pushes that I actually have come into developing a research program as a faculty at the University or uh, Rutgers University uh, in New Jersey, but also um, uh, uh, from project ideas from different students that actually come to our lab. Uh, the focus of the work that we do uh, has a real direct uh, conservation implication for bats, particularly in insular bats, uh, uh, bats that are basically stuck in paradise, if, you know, so to speak, uh, and, and therefore face really different conservation challenges that are interesting to look at. Uh, the questions that we address in our lab come from uh, different type of perspectives. Um, if I can make this um anyway um the work that we do is incredibly diverse. We have a really diverse group of students that come to our lab from multiple countries. We are a trilingual uh, a lab, so we can uh, host you in Spanish, English, and also in Portuguese. And, the re and that diversity also is reflected uh, in the kind of research that we do. And what I'm highlighting here today are some of the areas of research that we typically tackle in our program that combines multiple types of methods and types of fields as well to actually answer questions that relate to the extinction and speciation biology of bats, particularly for insular system. Now, this actually, as you will see, will have additional conservation implications for the local biodiversity in this region. So obviously, you know, you, 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 love, you love islands, hopefully. Uh, and I bet that I don't have to convince you that islands are really terrific systems to study biodiversity. Uh, particularly the Caribbean is divided into three kind of different regions in terms of the archipelago. So we have an eastern volcanic arc that makes the lesser Antilles. We have the greater Antilles over here, the big islands. This is Puerto Rico, Española, Jamaica, and Cuba. And then we have the Bahamas and the Turks and Caicos banks. And all these islands are kind of geologically different. Um, uh, scientists that have studied the, the, the geology of the Greater Antilles, for example, have shown that these big islands have been in this place roughly for about 25 million years. And given their patterns of isolation and distance from the mainland, their geologic history and different climatic events that affects them, uh, they actually form a really interesting and really fun center for bat evolution and diversity. Now, the Caribbean is also kind of infamous for having no mammals, right? Every time I tell scientists, hey, I work with mammals in the Caribbean, they kind of laugh because over 80% of all the mammals that we find in the Caribbean are actually known from the fossil record. They're all extinct. However, some of the, bat, the native mammals that remain from uh, many of these islands have been bats. Bats in contrast to non-flying mammals, 
it actually shows higher levels of diversity. And for many of these islands, they're the only native mammals that exist today. Uh, today, we know that the Caribbean, across the Caribbean, we have 61 species, uh, and they range in ecology, uh, different diverse ecologies, as well as diverse communities that form assemblages that combine either local endemics, like single island endemics, regional endemics across the West Indies, and also some species that are uh, uh, distributed both in islands as well as in the mainland. And at the most basic level, the kind of work that we do focuses on creating biodiversity inventories across all of these islands. Uh, over the years, I have actually visited nearly every island, every major island of the Caribbean in search for bats. So we typically just catch these animals in the field. We uh, take them and take standard measurements. We identify what species there are and make our inventories. But more importantly, we also take uh, tissues so we can actually do genomic analysis. But from the places that we actually study these bats, I also conduct paleontological excavations. And we actually are combining this really cool temporal aspect to science in the Caribbean that is very unique. In the places that we catch the living bats, we also did these excavations so we can understand how communities from the past compare to communities that are living here in these places today. And all of this allows to kind of understand a little bit better biodiversity changes over time, particularly focused on on, on bats for the region. So I'm, I want to highlight several studies that kind of exemplify the work that we do. And then later on, I'm bringing some of the challenges that I have faced working in a, in a, in a such a complex system uh, of island biodiversity. So typically the work that we do, I tend to pitch it uh, going a little bit beyond the typical kind of paleontology, going besides or beyond uh, just documenting paleontological communities or fossil communities. Uh, here exemplified in this map are, are basically localities that either I have excavated myself or with the help of colleagues, or also some places that have been excavated before that have been deposited at natural history museums. And these are the kind of fossil communities that I have been looking at for the past uh, years. Now, as you can imagine, we go to a place, we dig a big hole, and then from this big hole, we actually do a very detailed layers. We do it in a kind of archaeological sense. So we're digging five centimeter layers and from each of these layers, we identify all of the vertebrates that come out of this hole. And as you can imagine, we uh, use uh, techniques for radiocarbon dating just to basically take a, a date or an age of these fossils represented from each layer. And you can actually see that as you go deeper and deeper, any of these fossils we expect to become older and older, right? What this gives us is a, is a perspective of when these uh, bats were present in the past. And what was the community like in the past? And we can pinpoint precisely when these animals or what the community actually looked like over time. So I want to bring you one example for a species that we've worked with uh, extensively. And this is a greater antelian long-term bat. This is a teeny tiny nectar feeding bat, very closely related to the Glossophaga bats that, that you have here in the mainland as well. And this little guy is, is very special to me. I've been, and this is actually one of the first species of bat that I caught when I was an undergraduate back in the 90s. Now today, this little nectar feeding bat is uh, distributed across the greater Antilles and also the southern Bahamas, as you can see represented in these yellow dots. The red dots are actually places that I have either that dug or, or dug conducted excavations with colleagues or, or has examined fossils, have examined fossils. And as you can see, some of the islands, we have a combination of red and yellow dots. That means that this animal has been found in fossils and still a lot of this animal that has persisted in these places for a long period of time. But not too long ago, we actually did an expedition to the northern Bahamas here in the island of the Great Abaco. And out of one of these excavations, we were able to identify this species way out there in a population that we could we didn't even know existed, right? This animal has never been caught there at all, showing that this population is today extirpated. When we built our radio carbon chronology, we know that this animal became uh, I think roughly about 1800 years ago. And this actually kind of gives an idea to answer questions such as, well, how did climate change of the past from a glacial time to an interglacial toasting time like we have today really uh, 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 affects the, kind of the communities or the species that we have in these islands. So from this, we actually have, have hard evidence, right? That, that the deglaciation uh, that did not contribute to the loss of these animals that they persisted over time. But we can then use bioinformatic and computational techniques to actually directly test whether climate might be affecting these animals in the region. And for this, I did a combination of ecological niche models with the paleontological data as well as uh, modern uh, bat localities. And what I'm presenting here are climate-based suitability models of habitats. So whatever you see a color basically represents habitats that are suitable for these animals to exist today. 
Uh, the cool thing about this method is that you can actually make these projections across time. So here's a, a suitable habitat in the present, 6,000 years ago, and then in a glacial time, about 21,000 years ago. As we can see, uh, suitable habitat for these animals to exist appears there over time. But the cool thing about this method is that we can also combine and build what is known as stability. And these are the places where, where suitable habitat has been stable over time. And as you can see, these islands in the northern Bahamas still actually become climatically suitable over time. So what is it that is actually happening to these communities? Why are they being lost? It's actually a little bit of a, of a, of a puzzle that we're actually kind of trying to answer. Why are these populations becoming in danger? And why are actually some of them are, are uh, becoming extirpated? Now, I'm trying to address this also from a genomic perspective. So from the places where these animals are alive and we can catch them, I actually take a, a, a basically sequence genomic data. And here's an example of one of the analysis that we recently were almost about to publish this. So this is a slide for the same species. This is the greater Antillean long tongue bat. And I'm showing you here two populations, right? So here's a population from Española and here's a population from Puerto Rico. It's actually a very complex analysis. So really ask me afterwards, but basically what, what we're actually doing here is scanning uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms from across the genome, right? And using those uh, uh, data from the observed individuals that we catch today and building different models, basically building simulations on their hypothetical historical scenarios. So we have three different alternatives here that we want to test to better understand how these communities might have been affected. So we can, for example, we know that this uh, that the, the population of Puerto Rico basically was founded by a population in Jamaica in Española roughly about six hundred thousand years ago. So we can actually model the colonization of, of Puerto Rico, and then without any gene flow, what's going to uh, whether or not the data actually may look like may look like this, or we can compare that with an alternative uh, a hypothesis in, a hypothesis in which after colonization there's continuous gene flow. And a hypothesis that after colonization, there's gene flow in the past, but not in the first. And then we can convert all these models to our real data, and then we can figure out which of these models best explain how these animals really look like in time. And all of our models, or not, not all of our models, but the, the vast majority of the models actually support that the absence of gene flow in the present is the, the kind of pattern that produces the, the signatures, the genetic signatures that we see today. And this has really strong implications for conservation because once these bats become isolated, any population that remains alone without any, any members from other islands to go and save them, right, could become highly impaired. So this is one of the spins that we're actually using to, to uh, uh, study this, the conservation aspect of these bats. But also we can ask what other factors may have contributed to, to, to some of these losses. And I'm gonna bring you to a completely different island. Uh, today we're gonna go to the, now we're gonna go to the island of Cuba in which we examined 17 different unique localities. And from these localities, we did, we examined excavations from each of them and built radio chronologies from each of them. Now these sites are incredibly diverse and we recovered 95% of all the mammals that are known to have become extinct for Cuba we actually recovered them, including some uh, uh, fossils of the Cuban vampire bats, which are really, really uh, bad. But one of the things that we can look from these radio chronologists is that we can pinpoint exactly when these communities were changed. And our data actually shows that the majority of these communities, actually 70% of them, all of those fossils actually date to a period that is uh, on, from a late indigenous colonization, so roughly about 1,500 years ago. So what this actually directly tells us is that human impacts likely could be affecting these bats and, and, and changing the community composition for these animals. Now, not only that, we are actually seeing from this data, as you can see in the white bars, the only remaining mammals are the ones that are still alive on these islands are actually all medium-sized bats. The bats that are the, or, or medium-sized uh, vertebrates, the, the ones that are actually on the extreme size, either really big or really small, are the ones that are particularly uh, affected by uh, human interventions or extinctions. Now, all of this uh, has uh, has this broad implication of like what we're doing is kind of documenting what is actually happening to these communities over time and how they're changing from completely different angles, right? But this actually has a really direct implication for what what for the next step. How can we actually use this data to take conservation action? How can we actually inform the places where we actually do these studies, right? And the, and the stakeholders that are necessary to make these changes for conservation of bats. And, and along those lines, I also brought in a few challenges that I see over my years of experience in the Caribbean may actually help us move to the next step. 
So one of the challenges, the first challenge that I uh, uh, identified is that we want to have consistent and broad, broad scale capacity development of diverse scientists. Very similar, and this is a topic that has been recurring, you know, uh, throughout our work is that many times we actually have these parachute scientists that go in for a week from afar and then they leave and they'll never talk to us again, right? And this is something that we really want to change because we want to build the capacity that is local so that local scientists can actually lead these kinds of studies. We also want to unify teams and the methods that the different teams actually uh, uh, bring to examine biodiversity, but broadly in, in the entire archipelago. It is great to work within an island or within a region. That's something that Rodrigo was also addressing early on. Uh, here's all the science from this country, but this country doesn't talk to it. It's near neighbor, right? We have to completely get rid of that because broad patterns of biodiversity are the ones that are gonna help us actually conserve the species into the future. And lastly, we really ha have a deficit in terms of communication with stakeholders to identify, you know, what are the needs for different species and, and create opportunities in which local scientists can really excel and perhaps open job opportunities or funded opportunities so themselves they can be the leaders of science or quality biodiversity conservation in their own countries. Now, I'm I'm here Puerto Rican little kid, you know, and I actually work in the United States. This is actually, you know, designed by the system, right? Uh, you know, in Puerto Rico, currently, there's no open opportunities for me to actually go back work and contribute to this work directly, but I'm actually taking advantage of the place where I am, going back home and trying to make these changes, train people, help fund people, and, and create science that is actually inclusive for all of us in, in the broader Caribbean. And with that, uh, well, actually, I shouldn't have done that part. I want to thank the following, and uh, later on, we can talk a little more about questions. Angelo, thank you so much. Super inspiring and fantastic to hear about everything that is happening in an archipelago-wide approach. And so from the local team of Global South Bats, we had a problem. We had so many people that could have given a talk and it was really hard to select, but uh, Carol ended up being the selected person that is gonna present a fantastic work that is called Bats and Drives, Contributions of Insectivorous Bats to Test Russian Services in Mexican rice fields. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank <laughs> you. 
Good morning, everyone. Okay, so today I'm gonna share with you a little bit of my work with my master's degree. If you can see me. <laughs> um, and I want to start my presentation by asking you a question. Good. Tengo una caja de leche por ahí. So to start my presentation, I was I want to ask you a question. When was the last time that you ate rice? For me, the answer is maybe yesterday. And the reason uh, why rice is so important is because of its high um, high concentration of uh, energy, like food energy, in such a cheap and accessible um, food. So this is a reflex of how rice is one of the most important crops in the world. But as any other crop, rice is affected by a wide variety of pests and insects. And one of the most important insects that affect rice worldwide are, are, are rice waters. Rice waters are these nocturnal moths that during larval stage feed on the inside of the, of the plant and avoid the rice to peel, generating these kind of symptoms called blunt panicles. But at the same time, these kind of moths have been described to be part of the diet of one powerful animal that is uh, one major predator of these kind of moths during night. And these animals are bats. So they are described to be major predator of nocturnal arthropods, including these kind of moths. And major uh, models have been developed to estimate the, the potential of these bats as pest controllers. These kind of models use a series of untested assumptions on the um, uh, life history traits, both on the pest and the bats populations, to come with a monetary value uh, that can be assigned to that ecosystem service. In this case, the avoided rice loss countrywide um, cost of mm, the effect of Tadarida Plicata in the control of the white bat plant hopper was estimated uh, for more than uh, $1 million dollars around across Thailand per year. The good thing is that uh, though these kind of models give us powerful information for leading uh, important management conservation and sharing the importance of us, there is a more accurate method that can be used for assessing the specific effect of us in the production, uh, abundance of herbivores and crop damage. And those are explosions. So closures allow us to experimentally set up a condition where you can estimate what happens if we lose all that tomorrow. And with this kind of experiment that have been uh, recently used for area insectivorous along the world, you can estimate the, those kind of, of, of differences. Um, but these kind of experiments have been recently used again in for area insectivorous along the along the world, but never in rice in the American continent. And that was the reason we decided to test this in Central Mexico, estimating the contribution of the ecosystem of this ecosystem for these ecosystem services from insectivorous bats. And for that, we wanted to estimate first the effect of the insectivorous bats in the abundance and crop damage 
And then we wanted to translate that into an economic value. Where exactly in the center of, um, of the Mexican country, um, in a county called Emiliano Zapata, that is basically uh, basically constituted by uh, part, patches of dry tropical forest in green, then a lot of crops including rice, sugarcane, and flowers in orange, and then these massive urban patches um, closest to the closest to the lowlands. So that in real life looks like this. Basically, you have the highlands with the remains of the dry tropical forest. And then in the lowlands, you have the crop, the, the rice crops. And those rice crops are, um, are, are grown with tra traditional farming practices. And no pesticides were applied during the, during the development of the experiment. And the communities you can find here in terms of borders are basically three groups of like three uh, genera that are Rupel and Vinela, Malofini, which is the Mexican rice border, and a group of species from the genera Diadrea. And at the same time, uh, we have at least 38 species of insectivorous bats, including uh, explicata, which is an Balanuri, which is the most active bat in the in the right fields. And we have other Vespertilians and Mormopids in the area with huge caves um, holding thousands of individuals each. So to assess the effect of these guys over here, over these guys over here, we set up experimental designs, a total of six replicates along the along, along the county, each one consisting in exposure and a pair control. And each exposure was consistent in a huge structure of 20 meters by 20 meters by five meters tall that was open every sunset and uh, closed every sunset and open every sunrise. Um, where we were measuring uh, in a in a total screening of uh, two point five meter lines, the total amount of black panicles, which you can remember is the symptom of the rice fields, the adult waters, and the egg masses. And at the end of the experiment, we assess the gel inside and and outside of each explosion. Why? Because we wanted to translate this into economy. And for that, we needed the rice load, the rice loads in kilograms per hectare, but we also had the alternative of using the direct count of plant chemicals to translate into weight. And that we multiplied for the cost of the onion rice, like in the in the crop gate, and in two meal rice, which is a price for the for the consumer. And that is why we, we were aiming to obtain two economical values for the pest suppression service for the bats. So after six months of mud into like up to our knees and hard field work, we were able to demonstrate that bats were having an effect. And that effect was huge. So we uh, find out that with the presence of bats, the amount of plant chemicals was uh, redu was uh, reduced, but less by less than half. In the case of the, the adults, were almost half, and the, in the case of egg masses, was less than half. In other words, what we were seeing is that bats were efficiently suppressing the amount of adults. In consequence, suppressing the amount of eggs they were laying, and in consequence suppressing the amount of rice and blank particles they were generating. And this was not stable a long time, a long time. So in the case in, in the case of blank particles, you were seeing that the effect of the uh, lack of a predator generates a more um, that the, the amount of plant particles keep increasing among sample days or uh, Julian days. And with the presence of predators, it was almost stable. So the moment where you can see the, the highest difference is the moment of harvest. And the same thing happens with the amount of adults, where you can see the, the difference with and without bats increases a long time. But something curious happens when you see the eggs. So in the eggs, you're seeing what you see is that the biggest difference is in the middle uh, day of sampling which is a consequence that from this moment, 
the plant will go to senescence before the before this larva can go to adults. So the the adults decide not to invest energy and lost energy in eggs that are not going to be replicated in the next generation. So talking about the economical estimate, um, we needed this data uh, to come with that economic estimate, which was the yield difference, the the, the yield difference uh, per square meter or per plot. But the thing is that if you you can see that it's a slight difference, and with that you produce a little bit more of rice and a little bit more um, of rice in both cases. But those differences are not statistically significant. So we use uh, the difference in crop damage because we knew even if that was not significantly reflecting in weight, we knew that there was difference in the amount of plant particles, and every plant particle has a weight. And every that weight can be translated into that missing piece that we have here. And that way we were able to realize the difference, the, the economic value of the ecosystem service provided in that year for every hectare was three more than three dollars for annual rice and more than eight dollars per hectare per year in your rice. And this is very similar with other economical estimates, for example, made in Boyles in 2015, and which were um, making this, est this economical estimate for, for corn, corn, uh, corn crops, where the difference with the, the value of the ecosystem service was around $7 per hectare per year. Um, and beside that, just the importance of this and the take home message is that the importance of these kind of experimental approaches are allowing us to have much more accurate estimates that are way powerful tools to talk to general public decision making because we'll protect, I think we'll here are protecting bats because we are devoted to, to that, but Convincing decision making decision makers are it's a little bit more hard, but something that we all understand is money. So these kind of um these kind of, of of words help us to really have those arguments that are um allowing us to to really get to people. And I want to highlight two two of the strengths that I have identified in this kind of work and two of the challenges that I have. So I think the, the greatest strength that we, that we have in the global south of the hour of doing this kind of research is that we are extremely flexible and research, researchful in the sense of us that I made the disclosure with um, local grown bamboo that were available in the landscape, uh, key rings that you can buy in every store, and a football net, and that was all. So I think that we have a major advantage in the sense that we can make more from less, and that we are very flexible. And if I could uh, point a couple of challenges is that we are lacking some um, long-term assessments on that are sometimes needed for these kind of experiments. And what I mean by that is that I didn't have um, baseline past um, data from previous years because this is not something that is done in these areas. So sometimes when you want to answer a really a specific or developed question in these kind of areas, you're lacking the baseline. You don't know which species are there. You have to start from the bottom. That is, okay, which is the bad species list, which is um, the name of the pest, because um, you don't know that. So the lack of baseline is one of the, the challenges that I would say. And the other one is that the only reason I could the, do um, this project is because luckily in Mexico, they have a scholarship that allow to to study that, like make a, a master's, and they are paying you a scholarship for this. But for example, in Colombia, it would not be possible for me to do this because you are lacking scholarships. Um, they are less abundant, and you have to pay for the masters. In the case of the UNAM, the UNAM is for free. 
So I think this is the two challenges that I would uh, recognize. And I want to thank everyone that has done like all my research possible. And if you have any questions, we can discuss that later. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. And for everybody on Zoom, we are now going to take a coffee break. So we're going to be back in 30 minutes. So please go ahead and make your own coffee, make your own tea, have a beer if it's beer o'clock in your place. We won't judge you. We cannot actually can't see you. So to continue in time, thank you to everybody that is also still on Zoom. And... <laughs> Our next presenter is Ara Monajan from Eswatini. And Ara is going to present about access to museum is a key factor leading to the growth of African bat, African bat taxonomies. And so Ara, take it away. Good morning, everybody. Um, Thank you for attending this uh, my presentation, and I'm really happy to be here. Um, I would speak in Spanish now, except my African colleague here would not understand, so I will continue in English. Uh, we were asked to end off the our presentations with some challenges. I'm starting my presentation with a challenge, so the answer is already clear here. I want to tell you about museums, the importance of museums and how not having access to museums for much of Africa is, uh, has slowed down the growth of taxonomy and hence description of species in Africa. So Africa has a very, um, a, a, it's got a diverse performance. Um, I always hate talking about diversity when I'm speaking to uh, American because your diversity is mega diverse. But we've got over 300 species described from Africa. But more importantly, we are continuously describing new species at a very high rate, possibly the highest rate. If you factor in how many taxonomists work in Africa compared to how many species we describe, I think we probably outdo any other part of, of the world. But um, that is debatable. What I want to do is show you some examples from my own work where access to museums have been critical in furthering some of uh, some of my research. So I'm from I'm from Eswatini. It's in it's in the southern part of Africa, and we do not have a museum in in my country. At least we didn't uh, through most of my career. So just to this is the African continent. You all know it very well. Uh, I want to talk about, to start with, about one remote part of Africa. There is a mountain in West Africa called Mount Limba, and it's this beautiful uh, lowland rainforest that um, gives way to mountainous habitat at higher elevations, and it's one of the biodiversity hotspots for bats in Africa. In the 1980s, or by the 1980s. This mountain had been surveyed uh, on multiple occasions in the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s. And this was one of the last papers written on the bats of Mount Nimba by somebody called Andre de Bosse from France. And this is what I want you to take home from his, his surveys in the 80s. Um, I think you can all read French better than I can, but basically what it's what his conclusion was is that the bats of Mount Limba are amongst the most studied in Africa. This was in, 19, in the 1980s. He described 28 species from Mount Limba. I had the opportunity to go to Mount Limba on two relatively short expeditions in 2010 and 2011. And in those two months, I described five new species of bats to science. These five over here, 
I increased the number of bats from 28 species to 59 species on this mountain. And this is for an area which is amongst the best known in Africa. So you can imagine what kind of diversity we have remaining in other parts of Africa where we have not had this kind of um, um, uh, level of exploration. So there's nothing special about these five species, but uh, the reason I was able to describe these was because I had had access to type specimens of all of these that all of them were from the British Museum. Several years before this, I had by pure chance ended up in London. And while I was there, I took the opportunity to go to the museum and I was able to, to, to uh, examine a series of type specimens, which fortuitously allowed me then to describe these species here. Um, and I'll give you an example shortly about how, how, how important that can be. So in 2010, we published a book on the bat of Southern and Central Africa. We had 116 species listed there. We revised this book a few years ago, 10 years later, and we added eight new species to science in those 10 years. The reason I bring this up is that Southern Africa is viewed as a well-surveyed part of Africa. Compared to other parts of Africa, there are more bat biologists and we have more people on the ground working uh, with bats. And there are multiple museums in South Africa. So my point here is that taxonomy really is integral for bat uh, ecology, bat conservation, anything to do with bats, it has to start with a solid taxonomy, a foundation. So why is it that Africa has been so far behind in terms of, why is it that we're only now beginning to, uh, uh, to, to describe all these species? Well, they are several explanations or several challenges involved working in Africa. One of them is many parts of Africa are really remote. Remote, not just geographically, but they're also remote politically. It's not easy to get into many parts of Africa. It's full of dangerous animals. Like I had to fight that snake there that was trying to kill me, strangling me. It's difficult, dangerous terrain. No, that is not true. It's not dangerous at all. It's very exciting, but it's not possible to get in. Even if you have all the money in the world, there are many parts of Africa that are for political and for war reasons, they are just not accessible. But there's another difficulty, and that is, this is where, what I'm coming to here, it's to do with taxonomy. We have large numbers of species that simply uh, we cannot differentiate in the field. Here are two species of Hippocideris from, in fact, both of these come from Mount Nimber. They are two different species. I can tell you that they're different because they echolocate at completely different frequencies. Genetically, they're not closely related. And neither of these two has a name. And they don't have a name because all of the type material for Hippocideris is sitting in European museums that are not accessible to us. So we are sitting here with all of this diversity that we cannot uh, uh, progress on because we cannot get... Um, uh, Paul Wabala can tell you the same thing. We may get the funding to go to Europe, but then there's visa issues. And there's all kinds of other barriers that don't allow us to get to these museums. So what I want to do is to give you an example now of how taxonomy can be critical for conservation, because at the end of the day, we're here to conserve bats, and you may ask, you know, why am I talking about taxonomy? Because we are wanting to talk about conservation. I'm gonna stay with Mount Nimba so that we are focusing on the same area. Uh, there, there's the mountain range. I don't know if I could have... 
I can see anything without my eyes. Okay, I'll, I won't press any more buttons in case something, uh, the screen goes up or something. But you can see the mountain range, it goes from the, the southwest to the Netherlands in a northeasterly direction, and it crosses three different countries. There's a mountain range there. This is Liberia, Cote d'Ivoire, and Guinea. So already it's politically difficult. Three different countries. Um, me as an African, if I want to travel between these three, I need to get three different sets of visas, which I need to get in three different countries across Africa. It's, it's almost impossible to work across that um, legally anyway. So in the south over here, uh, right? so that highest peak over there is at about 1,700 meters above sea level. It's pretty high up, and it's full of iron ore. And so you can see that hole. There's a hole in that uh, the ground there. It's caused by this one of the largest mines in West Africa that uh, has dug in. It's dug so deeply that we don't actually know what the height of that mountain was before, the, because no one had measured it before they started digging for iron ore. Now the same thing is being proposed on the Guinea side. And here's the problem. On the Guinea side, that's the only place where we know of this bat, Hippocidrus mamati, that was described by André Grosset. So they did some survey work, not me, it was uh, some other bat experts. They did some survey work there, they caught a Hippocidrus, they were not sure if this is Lamachi or not. They then called me in as a bat expert to come and identify this bat for them to tell them, do they have Hippocidrus lamati or not? Because if they have Hippocidrus lamati, it's a critically endangered species and it will affect everything to do with that mining. Uh, so I went and surveyed that area and found seven different species of Hippocidrus, all the ones in the, uh, in the blue bars there. And then with one of those, was something I thought might be Hippocidrus lamati, but we don't have uh, the, the, the genetics for the species. And so I wasn't sure. The problem is the specimen itself, the measurements did not fit with uh, Hippocidrus lamati. The type specimen of lamati is in Paris, in the Natural History Museum of Paris. I was just lucky that I was there to, uh, I had been invited to work on a, a Rodents of Africa book, and I just happened to be in the collections when I said, please can I have permission to have a look at Hippocidrus lamati? They gave me that permission. Here it is, the type specimen. I re-measured this type specimen, and I want you to, the type specimen measurements are in the first numerical column. The second numerical column, the last column, those are the measurements of the specimens that um, I collected subsequently. And what I want you to look at is the two measurements of the phallus. Uh, Brosnay measured 14.3 millimeters. I had 18.2 in my specimens. 12 for the second phalanx, 20 for my specimens. This is why we didn't think we had hypocidrus lomachi. I then re-measured the type specimen in the brackets, and you can see that there was a mismeasurement by Bosse. He had completely mis he had measured something else altogether because oh he was very drunk when he did that. But without access to that type specimen, which is in France, in a faraway country, there was no way that I could have given the correct identification for this bat, a highly critically endangered species only known from that type of locality. Now we know that those bats there are critically endangered and hopefully the mining company will uh, work towards uh, with that in mind. So let me just come back to my, my key messages here. The challenges that we face in Africa most African countries do not have collections of bats. 
and most of the important bat material, the type specimens in particular, are in European institutions. It makes it difficult for us to access, and therefore the taxonomy invariably is done by non-Africans, even uh, for reasons that is out of our control. Molecular labs are a second thing that is really challenging for African taxonomy and conservation. We don't have outside of South Africa, there are very few labs that can do this work and very few labs that have the resources, the chemicals and so on to run those analyses. On the positive side, we are working hard to, to change this. And, um, I've been training up students, not just my own students, the first picture here is Robbie Mamba, he's one of my PhD students in Swaziland. In the far end there, that's Anna Gladish. Uh, uh, that's most of you, some of you here know, she did a master's degree with me. And I've done lots of uh, surveys with both of these guys, at least not both of these, but with many of my students, help them develop the, uh, the, the capabilities they need. On the other hand, we have now set up a museum in my country, in my lab at the university. We've also just set up a molecular lab that's looking at molecular forensics so we can uh, do analyses for the police. When they bring in samples of tissue of poached animals, we can tell them what animal they've got. And this has now resulted, this is my last slide, in us describing a new species of bat from a Swatini which we which, which, which named here, we say, Sanzani. Sanzani is a Swati word for the locals, for bushvelts, for savannah landscapes. And this has been extremely well received. We've had press conferences, we've, we've had interviews by radio, by TV. And I, I meet people on the street, and I'm not lying to you, I meet people on the street who come to me and say, you're the guy that has discovered a new bat in my country, in our country. So it is I think I've described more than 20 species of bats, but this one is the most special for me because the local people understand and can relate it because they see that name and they know immediately this is a bat from the local. Thank you. Well, right now, our next presenter was Eric Butler, but Eric is currently on a plane somewhere. Well, you can you check where Eric is? Uh, he had some problems with the flight, so he's not going to be in time for the symposium, but he sent his presentation, and now Paul Guevara is going to uh, be the, the, how do we say it? The other side that is going to present this after we finish Paul's presentation. So we get two uh, sessions by Paul. Yeah. From here, talk about after Ara, talk about parts of Cameroon. And Cameroon, Eric Barbo. It's on his way. And coming from Central Africa, getting connections is a nightmare. Him being here and had his flight in Kansas. So, on behalf of uh, Eric Barbo, eminent scientist, bat biologist in Cameroon, I'm going to talk about bat conservation in Cameroon, past, present, and future directions. Cameroon is in Central Africa, also in uh, West Africa, partially in West Africa. So on the north of Cameroon is Nigeria, Chad, on the east, west, maybe Central Africa, further south is Tropic of Congo, Brazil. Cameroon has diverse habitats and systems. And because of that, the country is very rich in biodiversity. From 
tropical moist forests, mountain forests, rural forests, savannas, name them. 409 species of mammals. And if you look at that, 9,000 species of plants. So in terms of the diversity of systems, Cameroon is very rich, like most of Africa, around the equator. And because of that diversity, 92% of African ecosystems are represented in Cameroon. Cameroon. And that Cameroon is called tiny Africa, mini Africa. However, because we're in Africa, we're not in Latin America. We're not in Europe. We have the so-called charismatic megaphone. So most policies, most political policies are focused on megaphone. When you look at bats, which are at least 25% for mammal diversity in Africa. I'll talk about Kenya. When you look at that, most of the policies, most of the management, most of the funding is focused on the big, so-called big five, and nothing little on the most diverse and perhaps and potentially crucial ecosystem services provided bats and rodents. But the question is coming what has been achieved today in terms of bats? We say 25 percent at least 25 percent of our mammals of the mammals in Canada are bats. So what have been achieved in terms of bats in Canada? Where are the gaps? What do those gaps lie? What could be done to, to fill those gaps? And there's a historical perspective to that. From 1900 to 2000, because in Africa we've been colonized by invaders. What has been done after we got independence? After 2000, in the year 2000, until now. And what can we do to death? Most of it has been done about bats. In Cameroon and the rest of Africa is by people from the West, the global north, no local biologists. Most of the studies are by Westerners. No financial support for locals. No capacity building. When the Westerners leave, there's no legacy. You leave, you've been there in Cameroon, you've been there in Congo, you've been there in many countries, but you don't leave anybody except people who carry bags, porters, not even technicians, people who carry equipment around, handymen. In countries, especially scientists, where that has happened, a minority others because they were available to carry equipment, they were quarters. And very important, crucial. In many countries in Africa, in Cameroon, at least in Kenya, we'll talk about that. Lack of keys. 
for identifying our tax, our bad tax. Now, between 2000 and 2003, there was a first project led by an in country Cameroonian scientists. And this was funded by national, by funded by Bad Conservation International and Graph Foundation. That's still coming from the West. In 2012, that was 20, 2018, 20, 2008, because of having somebody, my friend Eric Bako Phillips, capacity building Cameroon has increased. Like I say, People from the global north come in and do their thing. They live in all the They don't train anybody. They don't train nobody. But having somebody native, born in the country, born in Cameroon, has led to 25 students from four universities. And as basic as it is, like it is in the record, they are trained in setting nets, handling bats, and very important. Because of this single person, Eric Bako, who is a uh, woman, woman, very for yeah. They have trained 25 students from four universities, four native universities in Cameroon, in setting nets, how to handle bats and how to identify bats. We find it from Bradford National Geographic. Now, currently, five regions. Previously, most of the focus was in Western Cameroon, but currently, not one region. Currently, seven regions, courtesy of a native local, Eric Bakker. Seven regions and different ecosystems of the country have been studied for birds. And because of that, from 2000, what is two scientific publications led by in country scientists by one PhD holder, Eric Park. And because of that, there are bad biologists in three universities in Cameroon. Six PhD holders completed. Three ongoing defended PhD. Seven master thesis defended and two ongoing. And several grants from IFS, Science and Freedom, Idea World, World of Brand Movements, Rafford. So the living factors are before 2000, there was no single bad biologist in local, local university company. There was no single financial support for resident scientists for indigenous scientists in Cameroon. There was no capacity building. And importantly, like today, there was no lack, there was lack of key, keys and literature. After 2000, 
to the present. There are few. We need more biologists in local universities. We only have small grants in the community. We still have, we still lack keys to a little bit in Cameroon. And equipment are lacking at national level. We're talking about labs, generic labs. People have, individuals have, have drugs, mismeds, bad detectors. But there's no link between what they are doing in Cameroon and policy. There's need for evidence-based conservation. So feature and directions, we probably click for that four minutes, maybe two now. Bath space as much as the they bus ecologically and as medically, they face many threats in Cameroon, including habitat destruction and hunting. There are so many species in more countries that are covered. At least 120 species. The species are very diverse. And over 30% are present or that deficient. Population trends are unknown. And very few dedicated researchers. We are lecture to need for effective collaboration networks with the and student groups, research NGOs, collaboration practitioners. Very importantly, a rapid increase in fulfilling country like capacity, more cap academic capacity, and very importantly, and crucially, more funding for researchers. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for the meeting and having us present the work that Eric has said. I'm sure we have a lot of questions. We do have Eric here. Uh, hopefully, in a couple of hours, we'll be arriving. But right now, I want to introduce uh, somebody you know well, uh, and Paul uh, gives his presentation uh, on Kenya. Okay, so now I will go home again. Now I'm back in Kenya, <laughs> in my country, not Cameroon. And I'm going to talk about two things of what we are doing. First is very specific species. How does an endangered species, very endangered on the ISDN red list? We do not have hundreds of species red list. I am very open. They are Mbaluri, Tafuzuas, Ilagada. How does it select the roots? And this has very important implications to its conservation. In Balnuri, in the Gada, it's combat the Fuswas in the Gada. It's endemic to the coast of Kenya and Tanzania. We believe, because we don't know what's happening in Tanzania, that 70% of the population of the species is found in Kenya. The selection of roots by this embalmured sheep tail bat or suckling bat that was was in the garden. A species that occurs only at the coast, at the coastal strip of Kenya 
and Tanzania, including some islands in Zanzibar and Pemba in Tanzania. The focus of this study by the league is ongoing. It's in Kenya. At two major coasts. South coast of Kenya near the border of Tanzania and the north coast of Kenya in a place, a tourist site, a prominent tourist site called Watam in the north coast. However, we want to assess why certain caves are selected and not others along the coasts of Kenya, in terms of coasts and not coasts. And so that are caves that have this tumba, Tafuzuas in the garden, while the others and there are many that are, don't have this species. So why particularly some caves and not others? And this have, has implications for the conservation of this endangered species. And the factors that contribute to these threats of the species are many, including loss of habitats, logging, foraging habitats, including human presence in so many of these caves, because this is a colonial roosting species. So there are people visiting these caves for religious functions and for scientific purposes and also for tourism. But outside the cave, most of the habitats are being lost to development to human settlements and human activities. So what are we doing? I don't have the data yet. What are we doing? We are measuring several factors within the caves, macro habitat variables, temperature, humidity, and from humidity, we can measure the pressure. And this goes to the heart of the study. Why has the caves selected not others? But also measuring factors or variables such as size of cave and the complexity of the cave. Cave size dimension and how many entrances and so on. But also measuring human activity. Within the cave, be they caves with the target species, with the gadais, tombad, tombad, but those without that species. Comparative study. The next thing we're going to have time is a study that is 100% funded by National Geographic. We are in the Democratic Republic of Congo. We are just touching the surface. A country the size of Europe. A country that has so many challenges, including security. Dozens of militia. People coming from the global north on World War trips, collecting data on specimens. We've been only there for two trips, but we have basically doing expeditions on a, as an ex, a discovery, a discovery sojourn to discover because DRC, because of problems, inherent problems, has not <coughs> been sufficiently surveyed. 
هو يوزي فيريال تكنيكس هاب كرابس ان ماونتن اند تروبيكال لولان فورست ماونتن فورست ميس نيتس تو اكسبلور بيكوز دي ار تي كونغو از ا نيكست فور افريكا ذا نيكست فرونتير فور ديسكفري But we're not just doing bats. And what you're seeing there is a rich place looking for, it's a peaceful retreat place looking for whatever you can find. Chiros and rodents. Taking advantage of being there with dozens of militia. Dodgy militia, areas that we presume are safe to explore the biodiversity, especially of small mammals, including bats. And we've only been there for two trips, and we have very poor results already of lots of cryptic diversity. We, somebody talked about lack of labs. <clears throat> we are grappling with that because there are so many unknown diversity from DRC. For, from the lack of infrastructure, from the lack of because DRC have been colonized by Belgium, by a single person being left did not live in much infrastructure or human resources. But there are lots of places that are inaccessible. And from that, we are already, without analyzing what we are getting, we are already getting things like that, that with a very, that thing in the middle. With a very weird nose leaf, horseback that has up until now had no record of its frequency, color, its colors. For the first time, we've been able to record the record, uh, the record, the calls of that species, horseback, rhinolophus. We enjoy for the first time. So we're doing a lot of things apart from molecular analysis, wing punches. Sometimes for that species, we do have to collect specimens. And because of that, there are things to discover in their receiving. And what we're having on the far right is a very big blind mammal. Because we're using we're also setting up pitfall traps with drip fence. That is an a golden mall. Congolese golden mall. In terms of strengths coming from Africa. And I'm happy to be here. Because of one individual, Rodrigo, he has been able to bridge that gap, bring us here. Not just here, I've been in Peru, I've been in Mexico, and I've been seeing what Latin Americans, Mexico, Central America, and South America are doing. So, high diversity and tons of communities. Collaboration we must have lots of another questions. We have a lot of communities to collaborate. We have like anyone else in medical resources, in expertise. But very importantly, there's a, a clear disconnect of the big five between research and policy and on the fifth point because of community collaboration, there's limited 
collaboration between scientists, blood biologists, between Latin America and Africa. And I have had support from lots of people, BCI, Rough Foundation, USAID. Very importantly, why we are involved in an area that has least been explored national program. Thank you. So thank you, Paul. And now we're gonna shift to a different piece. We're gonna go to Asia now. And now we have Joe uh, Chu Chiamon, uh, who's gonna give us a talk about Kirobots, the first open code library on the so Thank you so much for being here, Joe. I know you want to know. So good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to come to Costa Rica and meet all of old friends, new friends. So I'm actually from Taiwan. I'm not sure that I want to go to the south or the north, but I have been working in South Asia for almost 15 years because COVID 19 is working places that I do not. And today, uh, I'd like to share an example of how regional network facilitated the infrastructure development in Asia. So I'm going to introduce you a kind of class, a collaborative information this. So it is reversely, but sometimes I forgot to thank my collaborators, sponsors, so you know their supports and contribution. Uh, just me alone can make this project happen. But I think I believe everyone here you know that the acoustics technology is an effective tool to start as the behavior in the environment. So the dream is uh, for you to from Europe or from North America or from part of North America. So you have this uh, idea too that the product is not so microphone to your smartphone or your tablet. So you record the sound on the best and the screenshot. But this is in uh, my belong to this whole because we know that we have so many so high but it's really fantastic. And this two professors say uh, this is not uh, happening. Most area in Asia are the shortest, you know, it's two. So you can buy the detector and drop it yourself. Or there's no spaces showing up on the screen because there is no data things open for the to be available, developed for two, especially the automatic part of the So I guess some of the students are not familiar with Asia. So in short Asia, we have very high species diversity. So I mentioned short Asia is including South Asia, South Asia, part of China. And so we have more than 400 species recorded on this area. So it contributes more than one quarter of global species count. So the development of beds, especially acoustics, is quite late for the rest of the decades. Partially because the studies are so very late, we still describe the students to find new species from the region of the year. And sometimes the revision of the new genome or new genes from this area. Yeah. Just like yeah. the most shock areas, they can resolve this. Yeah. Also, they can test uh, the infrastructure. So people don't know how to do acoustic in this area. Uh, so, uh, so we know that uh, sometimes the acoustic features are different from different species, especially uh, constant of frequency pets. So it's easy to identify species because you only image of the frequency of constant uh, frequency post components. And assuming that different species use different frequency, but it's not true. So by our study from some common species, the frequency change geographically a lot. And the rest of the evidence showing that even for the same species, they use different frequencies. All those different species use the same frequency in some areas. The most important is the lack of accessibility of the reference code for public comparison in most cases. So if you search online before we least study, you don't find any open whole life information that's but if you look at Google Scholar, so you can find a lot of published data paper. It's finding the coefficient of the best information country. 
But all these uh, reference codes and recording not assembled before. And you know, the culture, some Asian country, people are very uncertain. If you email people, say, oh, I would like to borrow the recording study because if I may compare uh, to my recording with the recording church, I mean, by species, you do have the answer. No, we have plenty of publish this recording in the future. So right now, I don't have this plan to share the data and you have to wait decades, literally. So people just don't publish the data. So what we try to do sometimes different people. So we try to explain them that in this data to this uh, Adria and uh, David, and also some Chinese scholars, we try to review the echolocation, publish data like the best in China. So it's good that we try to find a, a lot of publications, try to go feature of the best in China. Our problem is always with this limit uh, information in the last few minutes and many things in the case. So sometimes I think maybe we need to identify species which just try to uh, share the information for code feature and try to understand the hydrological information, what we represented. So in some study, we try to identify different frequency group of different component groups and compare the diversity of whole frequency, different uh, habitats. But in that case, the one that's going to try to assume it, she didn't know many best pieces, uh, but she, she tried to classify the co based on some of the frequency and the temporal features. And we correlated these uh, features with uh, non speed application or found a positive correlation. So this can be useful too for people to use a positive study as well. So, you know, the government would like it, they want to see the names. They want to know how many change of this frequency group and one group. They want to know how many things that we be recorded. They want to know whether we found the intention space or not. So this is the old beginning to South Asia. So we have a, a back conference in for Asia, South Asia and the Philippines. So doing a lunch and case supervisor at the Philippines. And then my good friend got also the final said, Oh, Joe, I'll buy you a beer. So it's one year to go my graduation. I was a very good patient, not still after four years, six years as a PhD student, still not even. So after a lot of beers, so I said, I promise both of you are going to work a whole life with patient that's so that's one of the things you can dream that maybe you don't think too much, maybe you like to challenge yourself. So how can we break down the barrier because the landscape in Asia very threatening? Because uh, Indonesia and the Philippines, uh, they are counting to more than 20,000 islands. So the landscape is very threatening. So like, we have very diverse language in Asia, which is a people from different countries speak different languages. That's also a language very good to communicate with each other. The conservative part of limiting numbers of make people have to share data. So open the same time, open data is not a new thing to be there. So only people can solve the problem. We have this uh, regional network called city groups, extend from Southeast Asia, bad conservation research units run by activists. And so we started at this network in 2007. And it was recruited in 2011 when JT has left. So in our network, we work with some people from Asia, especially Southeast Asia, with museums, work on, uh, with the local university, also have a uh, partner from Europe and North America. So we'll be together at Vegas so give a student uh, an opportunity to talk to people. So uh, I was lucky to try to know everyone in the network and try to adopt different culture for people who like drinking to be then or who like to cannot drink and talk to them. So we are quite funded from GB so trying to collect information of reference code on people. So the idea is because we got the money from GP, the GP don't want to data that one of the species first data. So that's the architecture of the project. We tell the partner in South Asia said, okay, uh, since uh, it's sensitive to share the first data for two, uh, how about you share part of the collection to reference for best at the same time as giving the metadata where you capture the best of species of the best in the time you capture the best. So we can extract this with meta information from the metadata coding. So I will uh, just clean the data, import metadata, and now I'm going to GP. At the same time, we are sending all the inference code to make a code language everyone. 
So that's how it is. So a standard, standardization of form for FM1 in Dublin for teach people how to identify, understand definition of terminology. And uh, we have this big and shared balance of the perfect review once rights because there are a lot of people concerning about usage of recording. So, for example, we allow people to write statements and say, uh, I contributed my recording to the database, but I cannot do it. Just holding it until I'm not sure I'm going to do it for three to five years. So, that's a bummer time of having one, and those also push people to publish the data. So, we held a little workshop, teach people how to do this. A civil conference is also to this line. So we make the first open co library for Asian events, so called Caravas. So the interesting you can scan the bar on the local website. Almost every recording there are open. So you can search the recording by country and by species or by contributor. So the achievement is a so far I guess they have been collecting more than four thousand Almost 250 best pieces from 14 countries and 10 countries, Asian countries, and another four countries from Africa or from America. And also, we collected more than 18,000 species of Chris data. So, that's uh, three times the species of Chris data in Chile for the same areas and regions. So, so, lots. so, compared to the some of the known collective, the best in the world, so I believe they were one of the largest collective in the world. And also, they are open. I don't think it's the, we are uh, most recording from Asia, but we also MBH is trying to collect some data from the world outside Asia. So, challenge. So, if you look at this, like the 4,000 seems large, but it's still a very small number because we understand that the interest based of the variation, the most basic basically is a frequency modulating base. So we have a living spatial and plus only coverage. So what gives a look at that? Uh, actually, even in Asia, we don't have data from some South Asian countries and most South Asian countries. So the biggest challenge is that we don't have a sustainable plans after the end of the funding projects. We are not able to continue this job. We have to use our own money to sustain support this website. Uh, we don't have enough time to work with people, clean the data, actually clean the data and the website really time consuming. And uh, I really work a lot myself to help everyone clean the data. So thanks. So well, Joe, thank you so much. Now we're gonna have a tiny break so everybody can stretch a little bit. So we meet back here in 15 minutes. So uh, I also want to say that we have an event joining us. So Maria Joao can you say hello. Thank you. And so 15 minutes, so we'll be back. And everybody on Zoom, again, have a coffee. And see you later. So hello, hello. Welcome back. And we're going to have the last talks. Unfortunately, the last talk today, Juliana. Juliana is still on a plane coming here. Uh, so we have some delays, but right now, it, it is my pleasure to present Rohit, who's going to talk about India. Um, and he's going to talk about fast in India and then we'll be on next. Time. Hello, everyone. Um, could be Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the problem with presenting to me is, uh, I mean, my goal is not just to talk, but also to keep you less agitated as we get closer and closer to lunch. Uh, I'll try my to not keep the, the agitation low. And um, so I, I recently finished my PhD, which is why I think that I am the only one who's still adopted at the beginning. So, um, I, <laughs> so now, uh, after my PhD, I'm now um, working with, um, with an NGO in India called the Minister Conservation Foundation and uh, Bad Conservation International in the US. And we are working towards, uh, we started a new Bad Conservation Project in India, which I'll touch upon as I go along. Um, Okay. Yeah. 
So India is one of the larger uh, global south countries. And given our size, given our large size and the geographical location of the country, there is a lot of diversity of habitats. And you know, we actually cover a much wider spectrum of habitats than many other global south countries. For example, towards the west of India, you have deserts that are as dry and as barren as you have hot deserts, but we also have cold deserts uh, way above the Himalayas. And then we have the Himalayas, uh, which of course are um, you know, all along the northern part of the country, some of the tallest uh, mountain ranges, some of the tallest mountains in the world are found here. And we have a uh, wet rainforest, quite a wet impact, and some with peculiar habitats, like these, uh, these habitats that are called myostate or swamps. They are like mangroves within a rainforest. And uh, these, the rainforests in India are found in the western parts. The North East India and the Andaman Islands. Islands are closer to Thailand than in India, and a uh, very interesting place where I actually did my uh, master's uh, thesis. And of course, uh, given that we are in the near tropics, these numbers are really laughable for a country that has you know, maybe 10 times for the data size, but for the whole world, this is actually a very good number. And we have 125 species of bats. Uh, belonging to night families, and obviously some of these are threatened. Some critically endangered, like the polar bat found in, in only one event in the south of India, an estimated population of less than 250 individuals. And of course, then we also have the little bird night form, which found in a tiny island um, in the Antarctic little bird chain of island that I talked about, which is rural island in Indonesia. And um, now that's a broad overview of you know the diversity of bats in the country. But the places where I have had the privilege of working are A, the Andhra and Island, where I did my master's project. And since then, since 2016, my focus has largely been in the Himalayas, and particularly in the western part of the Himalayas. This is a really fascinating place where the last bat surveys prior to my in 2016 were conducted during the British colonization in the 1870s. And during that time, from those records, we know that there were 40 different species of bats that were found here, and including an endemic species called the Peter Stew nose bat. And obviously, you know, given that these surveys were done much before even we knew about the term echolocation, there is no uh, there's obviously no uh, echolocation call library that existed prior to my work here. And over time, these landscapes have also changed drastically, right? I mean, from a British summer retreat to a Buckley city, in 140 years, this area, some of these the parts, of, some parts of the country, of the Himalayas, have seen drastic changes in the land use. So I started, when I started my survey in 2015, uh, 2016, I started with a rather, you know, at a very standard location. This is, this is a, this a very important landmark in the north of India called the Forest Research Institute, uh, again established by the British. Apart from the research institute, it actually serves a lot as a set for many other movies. <laughs> a lot of song and dance happens here during the day. And it was here that we found the fact that it had never been seen before in that part of the, of the country uh, under 10. And I think in the main side behind the pipeline was the bleeding bat, which we are now trying to you know, uh, understand the taxonomy better. So then you say I'm calling it the East Asian PKA bat, and I published this paper, it was called the European PKA bat. Uh, but this is just to highlight the point that you know, bats are so hidden in place that I think I think many parts of India that and there are not many people working on that. So from, from starting in, in the Forest Research Institute, I sampled many different habitats all over the western part of the commander, going from dry forests to cedar forests, dense oak forests, and all the way up to alpine meadows in the higher elevation. And this went on for a, for a couple of months. And after, after this, I came up with, uh, I mean, I published a paper in 2020, which details the entire uh, the survey of bats and in Himalayas, including preparing an acoustic call library for that. 
So in Europe, we found 35 species from high families, nine of which were found for the first time in the rest of the Himalaya. One species that was new to the country, one that was rediscovered, this one after 40 years, and uh, an equivocation called like it was finally prepared, which in which thing with 30 different species. And now you know so. As my title said, uh, it's about moving beyond taxonomy. You know, up until here is the is the part where I'm trying to understand what species exist and what where they are found, what do they call like. You know, that's the descriptive naturalistic part that as our author of the talk, you know, you can't do away with it. That's that's the foundation. But what needs to happen in India is people uh, people get you know deeply embedded in taxonomy and nobody really thinks of it as a starting point. Everybody's thinking of it as an end point. You know that's where that's that's what I thought would should should change. And I want to build upon this for my PhD, asking questions about how the communities are structured or you know how that diversity itself is structured in these mountains. So uh, apart from it, I'm not going to present a lot. I'm going to follow my entire for years in just two slides, but feel free to ask me more about it. Uh, but in order, so I went about asking questions like, you know, how do the diversity of that vary across elevations? And now, when we have areas of low and high diversity, how do species partition their interests in order to coexist in an area like this? Right? And this is study in this beautiful Kedana Wildlife Sanctuary, where we have a gradient all the way from 1500 meters to 3500 meters, a 2000 meter gradient of elevation. And obviously, I went there, caught that, recorded their calls. Uh, we also collected data on their big calls, which I'm not presenting today, but please feel free to ask me. And we collected big machine samples from which uh, we obtain stable carbon and nitrogen isotopes, and these are important. Uh, these are used to measure the dietary niches of that. I mean, not really dietary, but I'll, I'll, let's not get into the nuances of it. But here is, it can help you understand whether that is a uh, dietary generalist or a dietary specialist, and how much they then use this overlap. Uh, so we found that, uh, and in new day, no, actually, that species influence declines with elevation. That is the lowest elevation, that is the highest elevation. And, uh, and now that we have this you know, gradient of, uh, of elevation and how you know, some at, at a particular point we have high species business, at another point we have low species business, we then compare the niches of that in these uh, across this elevation gradient. And what we find is that at the highest elevation, where the conditions are hard, there are fewer species, but those species do not overlap their niches. And probably this is a mechanism to you know, avoid competition because there are already so few resources to deal with, right? And at the other hand, in the lower elevation, there's probably enough, uh, there's probably enough resources to sustain a higher diversity. So that allows species to have overlapping niches. So multiple species get packed into the same niche space. And I I, I think that you know, this is just in two slides, uh, a major part of my PhD. If anybody needs more demands, just uh, just catch me after during the lunch break. And from there, uh, to now, this has been, I mean, I'm making a big jump from asking questions about communities, about biogeography, to asking more applied questions. And that's what my current job in is. I have you know, that conversation with the National and Nature Conservation Foundation, where we come up with a conservation plan for South Asian bats, I mean, for Indian bats, globally expanding into South Asia. And uh, a major part of it involves, you know, finally liaising with people, liaising with bat researchers uh, in country, in the region, something that has been severely lacking bringing them all to a table and then you know, trying to create a roadmap of conservation. But we also have a lot of field money, which we are planning to use to launch um, field projects of conservation importance. And some of these are, um, I think, uh, Mexico would be very familiar with this project, 
Uh, on the communication in archaeological sites, right? So bats really like living in archaeological sites. The archaeological site managers don't want bats to live there. Uh, but some of these places, especially in the urban parts of India, like New Delhi, has you know 16th century monuments and probably the largest urban bat colonies in the country. So you know how can we we are trying to understand how bats use these spaces. How people perceive bats in these spaces to create uh, mitigation measures. We also want to understand uh, bat mortality and when it comes a global hot topic for which we have zero published information from India. And at the moment, I have two master's students who are working on the effects of urbanization on light and light on bats in uh, Bangalore, which is a city of 8 million people, and, you know, and because we are a country of one million people, even San Jose is a village for us, you know, when we talk about urbanization in India, it's sort of a completely different scale. And we are also um, trying to advance, help other researchers uh, advance their work on the conservation of uh, threatened species like the Salamanese Kulubad and the Kulali Kulubad. Now, all of, all of this, like, you know, my personal vision here is to actually form an institute to enable the institutionalization of bad research and conservation in India, something that has been lacking and something because of which students like myself have had to go abroad to their communities and to their uh, research. Now, to come to the strengths and weaknesses, some of which I've mentioned, but I'll go over them again. Uh, the strength of course in the immense diversity, not just uh, you know natural diversity, even anthropogenic habitat, but also cultural diversity, linguistic diversity, which um, makes people think differently about conservation, right? And uh, the challenges are the lack of funding, which is common across the Middle South, abysmal in country uh, capacity to carry out projects beyond taxonomy, even within taxonomy. Uh, you know, it just prevents the, the way people do research in India. And also, something that uh, I was hoping a lot of, that other countries would also face, but something that's starting relevant in India is the patriarchy, right? I mean, the patriarchy and the social hierarchy, the caste system, everything prevents diversity within the country. Right? I mean, it's it's come to this extent that it's only ecology and that research is something that privileged people like myself can do, but the lack of diversity in India is something that's missing in the country. And um, as much as I would like to talk about other people's work, I just don't know enough about people's work for my country, right? So that's another in within country collaborations and uh, conversations are missing. But something that India has done not as well, uh, this is the point that says you know, on both sides of the border, is that Indian policies have made it very hard for foreigners to work in the country. And um, this is starting from the post-independence, post-1947. And what, what this is, how does it benefit the country? Is that it is completely, or you know, to a great extent, excluded culture, right? Foreigners do not come into the country and you know use local resources without investing their you know time and energy into the local conservation or building local capacity. That's a problem that we sort of eliminated, and to the extent that we have suffered from you know like Southeast Asia has a Southeast has CBD and but we don't have one because you know foreigners have simply never worked in this in this way. So that then a reduced, uh, large reduction in our research output and the level of collaboration in the region with India and its neighbors. But until then, what we have is this, that, you know, not a work, not a much, but it's sort of one to work and it's not that locally by local researchers. And hopefully that will change as we uh, have a conversation here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rohit. Fantastic presentation. And now we need to close everything with a bow. We have the uh, second side. Is it work? Okay, thank you. Yeah. And um, let me find this.
And this is going to be the last presentation because, as, as we said, uh, Juliana is still on a plane coming this way. Um, so Sara is going to close this from Indonesia. From Indonesia, and her title is Concerning the Invisible Giants, Lesson, Learn, and Challenges of Flying Fox Research and Conservation in Indonesia. So uh, it's, uh, I'm delighted to be here and I'm delighted to host the symposium. I hope I can do it a little bit better. Uh, after Romney, uh, we move from taxonomy and then we go beyond taxonomy, looking at ecology, and I would like to bring you all from the on the ground conservation and renovations. Uh, I identify myself as a conservation scientist and also practitioner. So I have half of my life being a scientist, but also half of my life being practitioners working with different stakeholders. So you can find me in the mud casing bag, but you can also find me in the desk uh, talking to a lot of people and be stressed a lot of time. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about invisible giants out of so many bats in Indonesia. So we now currently have 239 bat species in Indonesia, and I don't want to make it into so many competitions, but we have the highest number of bat species in the world. <laughs> but, um, but, but the idea of it is that I can count by my thinking there are many people that work on bats. So I am passing it at my group from the Indonesian Institute of Science that work on that taxonomy. I have Elena Burisma who work on ecology, and there is me who work kind of in the interface of community ecology and conservation. So basically, there are five people in Indonesia that work on that. So the best diversity is really a pride, but also there's an irony that we feel more is more work and also supports in better research and conservation. So in this facts, uh, invisible diets are these large fruit eating bats. They are 300 grams to one kilo of uh, bats. And I'm, uh, I spent years to study specifically on flying foxes. These are the large fruit eating bats that mostly in genera of Telopus or Acerodon or Dipsomia. And the point of reference that person is me. I'm 150 centimeter. <laughs> It's just too short, but the wingspan of the flying foxes can up to 150 centimeter, uh, like me. And the pterobot day family or the flying and flying foxes are part of that family. It is distributed from Madagascar to India, also the rockets to it in his presentation, in the China Peninsula to the Philippines, Indonesia, and up to the northern Australia and Oceanic Islands. They quite distribute really widely in Indonesia itself because we have 18,000 islands, so we are the Arctic uh, nations, and many of the bad species are also endemic to each of the tiny islands. So the diversity and the ethnicity is uh, really fascinating. And uh, the flying foxes eat of nectar. As you can see, there is the gray headed flying foxes in Australia. There is also Mayan flying foxes, so they eat on food. And the that led me holding one of the smaller species of the flying foxes, uh, my favorite, because they are gentle. The other, like an uh, angry puppy, not a bad. <laughs> And because they're so huge, they lose in a mangrove areas and also in the tropical rainforest, especially for those who are in solitary or living in a small groups. Uh, in a roosting site like mangroves, they can lose up to 5,000 individuals to even 10,000 small individuals. So it's a huge, huge colony. And one of their favorite foraging sites besides tropical rainforest are fruit plantations. So far as all about papaya, so flying foxes also love papaya. And they even love all the tiny fruits that Indonesian like. Uh, do you have rambutan here? Yeah. Ah, okay. <laughs> See? So they like the rambutan, they also like langsa. How about langsa? 
No. Okay. So lungs are and also the fire. So tropical rainforests and the food plantations are actually their favorite breeding sites. And what is the conservation status of bats in Indonesia? So uh, tell what they is they are big. They are the most threatened group of bats because they are hunted for meat, for medicine, for the white heritage thing, and also experience more significant of habitat loss. And this become part of my motivation to still working on bats. But really, the main reason is because they are the world <laughs> They look like a puppy, and if you don't like it, yes, that was me as, <laughs> as a reference. <laughs> and uh, this is part of the factors that drive uh, many of the threatened species. So we have stream aquaculture. So the main use the roosting site and the farming of is get inverted for stream. Um, and this is exported to uh, any of the global north country. I don't know whether it arrives in Australia or even to other streams. And also the first conditions for, because of mining, because of small scale plantations, and also for oil plantations. So the wide area of threats. And the last one is because they like the foods that we also like, and very important economically, there are a lot of issues with food farmers. So if you open a YouTube and then looking for Indonesian farmers sharing on how you can prevent rats of attacking the food, you have so many. So there are also issues with food farmers, and in few parts, there are executions uh, of bats because they're considered as bats. And I would like to add light on the second biggest threat in the name of country. So from uh, to the west, to the east, the flying foxes in particular are hunted for the wide variety of reason. So you have small scale trade for, uh, for consumptions. They are fan of bats in the cage are being sold. You have spatial fright for medicine. So the heart of the flying foxes are believed to cure uh, asthma. And they are sold for that uh, for that reason. And also they are, because Indonesia is so rich, we have 1,300 ethnic groups. And many of the indigenous community also rely on fine foxes for their subsistence. So we have that part of the thing. But uh, I would like to focus on the middle trade in Sulawesi, that's where I'm from, where there is a disinfect hunting of bats, which uh, 500,000 until 1 million of bats per year can be captured just to be traded for uh, some kids linked to uh, cultural reasons. And so I think these the first challenges in, in a way that our limited understanding of, of what's exactly going on, not only the population, the threat, but also their importance in the ecosystem. I spent I mean, my undergraduate uh, years to go to the bush meat market talking about vendors need to hold my breath because you can only smell the stench of bloods and meats of bats being butchers uh, mixed with other kind of animals. Uh, they are trying to map out where exactly they hunt the bats, where do they supply the bats from, how many bats are being treated, and who are involved, and why bats are hunted on the show. And that's uh, the first part. And this is a huge map plot of where I do but I did my bat hunting survey. If you could see here, this is the mangrove area, and there's the bamboo over there. So they they put misnet in the bamboo during uh, dawn, and then when the bats back from the foraging, they will capture them uh, and then kill and put them in the fridge to be uh, transported to the northern part of Sulawesi where they are sold as bullion. And this is the network of the bullion markets that the bat, snake, any meaty things you can uh, find in the in the markets. But also during my time, you face like all these challenges of hunting, but you could also try and meet the community to love bats, to respect bats. So I met with this team of village who build daycats actually in forest did this local community to protect the bats. So in this village, uh, if you can see the bats, <laughs> the small the small birds. In this, in this village, the flying foxes just lose in front of the houses. And interestingly, during the uh, footing season for mangoes, they don't eat the mangoes of the villages. They fly somewhere else. So you can see, yes, you see the country, but you also see the beauty and the art community that have these strong values uh, type impacts.
And the second part is uh, uh, to research about the ecosystem services, trying to find out what are the roles of bats in the ecosystem and what life they do and what is the economic value of bat donation service to Durian. Uh, I'm not sure whether you have these fruits in uh, South America. Do you have it? Oh, you love it? <laughs> <There you go. laughs> so this durian is a fruit native to Southeast Asia. So uh, I and this durian flower only bloom during the night only one time. And it really implies that and it shows the baby parents are funeral animals, so moth and including a lot of them are small bats and also fine process for pollinations. So I did this uh, during my master degree to conduct pollination exposing experiments where I have the flowers close uh, and then I have the flowers that are closed but then open for insects and I have flowers that were open but I put some red traps on it to record what kind of animals that pollinate the bats and quantify it. And for over two months, I tracked uh, and counted how many durians actually are being produced from each of the treatments. And after the uh, modeling, I spared details. Yes, I proved that the bats pollinating durians in Sulawesi and the fine foxes that we've seen before are being hunted and are being treated in the bushmates who are the significant pollinators for durians. So I kind of use all these information to establish locally led incubation for bat starting in 2018. So I think we are the only organization, a non profit in Indonesia that have designated a bat uh, program. At that time, I was thinking, oh, I wanted the recommendations in my thesis, but I was thinking, who's going to read it and who's going to actually do it? So as someone said from the RM, they just said, uh, maybe I should just do it. So without zero money, first year, with second year, only one hundred and fifty dollars, I'm still doing it. But really, with the help of the local communities and with the local families, we are able to establish the fine fox cultivation program, working for gray fine fox, uh, Sulawesi fine fox, and the black fine fox. The second one is the endemic to Sulawesi, the gray and red fine foxes have uh, larger uh, distributions. Uh, there are so many details and nuance how they're doing conservations. It's very interdisciplinary science and very reality. So I just want to sum up that uh, in our best conservations, we have engagement with community. So we work together with the fishermen group to protect the bad islands. We work with the village government in a way to align conservation and village development agenda, and we also have educational programs. So this the result of the ecosystem services, we wrote a book out of it and uh, made a poster, and we went uh, storytelling from school to school, from village to village, joined by more than a thousand kids now for over six years to, to join our educational programs. And then, uh, we also did research for monthly uh, monitoring of population and also study of climate of the system sort of thing. And the last one of the capacity building, uh, we have uh, worked with local university, but also with the young generation in the villages where the climate of this are hosted. And we focus on research, conservation, and also leadership skill, really thinking about not only running conservation programs, but they're actually leading it. So these are, this is my collaborator with the wife of the fishermen that I'm very close with. Those are the young generations and we work with a young generation who are less fortunate in socioeconomic and education. They are working on jobs, they only graduated high school, but yeah, we believe that we help everyone to be a scientific innovation in their own way. Yeah, and we have the education and there's another fisherman who always give us a free fish um, to eat on the islands. And really just starting with 500 bats on the islands now become a safe harbor for 50,000 bats. So uh, for six years, it's really fulfilling. It was very hard at the beginning, but uh, we are, we are, we're doing it slowly but slowly. And the challenge is, I think you already reiterate with others, limited research, lack of conservation attention and legal tools. Out of 239 bats, only three species are being protected, 
and the menus are actually situated outside the second area system. But really, it's a challenge, but also give you a second creative space what we can do about it. So I think the strength of the uniqueness and mystery of that, so much we don't know, and also working in the community and championing of the lab innovation is a way to go. And we are also developing our site to be the center for that research in foundations. So if you have any idea of research or if you want to discuss with Indonesia to see how we're flying process, our arms are wide open to, to welcome you and host you and gracias. Vamos a so after that final fantastic talk, now we can say goodbye to everybody else. Thank you for joining us and for being here. And what we're gonna do is we're, we're just gonna try to pull together a little bit of um, these things that everybody put at the end of their presentations. So this is now an open discussion. What are the common challenges and the common strengths that uh, most of the presenters have identified? Who wants to start? Please, this is an open conversation. We have an extra microphone. 